Okay, good morning. Um, morning, everyone, and good morning to all the online students. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let's pray and let's get started. Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to come together, spend time in your word, learn and equip ourselves so that we could serve you and we could serve people well. We ask, Lord, for the anointing, for the leading and the ministry of the Holy Spirit to open our understanding, to open our thinking, to enlighten us, to fill us with truth and revelation, and to help us, Lord, to serve you well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So um, last week we had only one class. Uh, all of you got the notes, the printed notes, okay. Uh, online students, I think all of you would have downloaded the PDF, so uh, we will be using that. And um, let's quickly just review what we covered last week, uh, and then we will proceed forward from where we paused. So... Lesson one, very first lesson, we defined the meaning of the word apologia. Um, we didn't look at all the references, so I would request you to please uh, go through all the other verses on page four, uh, just to see where that word apology is used and, and how it is used in English. Right? It, but in essence, it means to give an answer to give a defense, to explain what you believe, why you believe, what you stand for, right? And uh, we said that in some ways, the Lord Jesus himself was a great apologist, master apologist, because he took questions. When people came and asked him questions, he didn't say, don't ask me any questions. <laughs> he welcomed. When people came with questions, he welcomed them. Only sometimes some people came with questions in order to trap him. That he didn't accept, right? But then he asked one question back. <laughs> he said, okay, you want an answer? I'll ask you a question. You know, so he, he knew that. But generally, when people came with, sincerely, uh, with sincere questions, he took the answer. He explained. Right? Even his own disciples came said, Lord, can you tell us the meaning of the parable? <laughs> you know, you gave, those, gave them all the parable. We didn't understand. Please explain. He took the time to explain. Right? He didn't say no. Right? He explained to his uh, disciples. And then we looked at the Apostle Peter, uh, 1 Peter 3.15, that's, you know, the, the foundational text uh, on which uh, this, this whole Christian ministry of apologetics is built on. But Peter told, you know, be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that you have in you. You know, give an answer, give an apologia. Uh, and uh, like we mentioned last time, sometimes we tend to think that, oh, to be an apologist, you need to, you know, have a PhD, you need to be very, very, you know, smart and all that. But Peter, this is Peter who spoke, right? So it's, the implication is not you have to be smart. You just give an answer. Just explain why you believe. And Peter and John, we saw they were just fishermen. But because of the supernatural, that became a very powerful defense. People couldn't question. So we said that in, in, in the whole ministry of apologetics, um, we don't rule out the supernatural. We don't leave out the power of God. Right? The demonstration of the power of God itself is a big defense to what we believe. So expect that. But at the same time, be willing to explain to people you know, why we believe, what we believe. Explain it to them. Uh, in the ministry of the Apostle Paul, we saw that that was part of his ministry. He, Paul, unlike Peter, Paul was different because he was very, he was trained. He studied to be a Pharisee, so he learned a lot. But even he combined reason and demonstration. He reasoned and demonstrated. He did both. Right? He reasoned, but also expected God to do miracles and uh, prayed for the people ministry. So we came to this point on 
understanding the spiritual dynamics. Uh, this is where we stopped last week. Um, what we said is that 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of people. So the real battle is a spiritual battle. It is not about a logic battle, battle of logic or reason. It is a spiritual battle because it is the God of this world, the devil, who is trying to blind the minds of people, trying to prevent the gospel message from going into their hearts and minds. Right? So we must not forget that. Sometimes we think, oh, I have to explain better. Maybe I didn't do a good job explaining. Maybe I didn't go do a good job in my logic or my reason. Sometimes we take, think it's our effort. No, no, no. It is a spiritual battle. Right? So we also have to deal with that right? uh, through prayer, uh, through dealing with the works of darkness, right? Uh, in, in order to bring people to faith in Christ. So let's go to 2 Corinthians 10. We'll, we'll start from there today. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 4 through 6, um, the Apostle Paul is talking about our weapons of warfare. Second Corinthians 10, 4 through 6, he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So Paul is talking about the weapons of our warfare. Now, there used to be a time when people say, you know, you should take the scripture and say, oh, we are, we've got these weapons and we are pulling down strongholds. Uh, and the picture that was painted was that these strongholds are somewhere in the heavenlies. You know, and uh, there are some big things in the heavenlies and we're pulling down the strongholds. But actually here, Paul is not referring to those kind of strongholds. What's he referring to? He's referring to strongholds in the mind. Because everything he's talking about here, he's talking about arguments. He's talking about things that exalt itself or that oppose the knowledge of God. That are contradicting the knowledge of God. So it's obviously arguments and reasonings in the mind. He's talking about every thought. Right? And he's talking about coming into a place of obedience to Christ. So the real issue here is about things that are going on in the mind, not something out in the heavenlies, you know, somewhere in the third heavens or somewhere. <laughs> He's dealing with things in the mind. And so he says, look, the weapons God has given to us. Using those weapons, we can deal with things that are troubling the minds of people. Strongholds. Arguments. Reasonings. Imaginations. Thoughts. These are things that are going on in the minds. We can deal with it in our own minds and also as we minister to people. We can address what the enemy is doing, trying to blind the minds of people. Because that's where he's working. He's working in the minds of people. Right? Deception, lies, thoughts, arguments, reasoning against the knowledge of God. So we are bringing the knowledge of God. We're bringing the gospel of Jesus. We're bringing the truth. But the enemy is also interfering. But we have weapons that God has given to us by which we can deal with those things. Right? And here he's obviously specifically referring to the Corinthians. And he says, look, when we, are do, when we do this, what will happen? What will be the result? Uh, your obedience will be fulfilled. That means we will see obedience coming out of you. And then we can deal with the disobedience of other people. Right? So... You see the whole process there, right? So, so we, we can deal with these things. We can see people come into a place of obedience. And then once we are all in obedience, we go out, you know, to deal with the disobedience of others, right? So 
there is the spiritual side which we must also engage in through prayer through intercession to exercising our spiritual authority and the power of the blood of jesus through praise and worship these are all weapons that god has given to us right which we can use to deal with these things in the minds of people that's one side right so keep in mind the spiritual dynamic and for the devil if you look at chapter 11 his main strategy is deception second corinthians 11 verse 1 to 4 he's writing to believers here or that you would bear with me in a little folly and indeed you do bear with me for i'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy for i betrothed you to one husband that i may present you as a chaste virgin to christ but i fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived ye by his craftiness so your minds will be corrupted on the simplicity that is in christ right so i just wanted to highlight here the serpent deceived so satan's main strategy is deception lies and right? he's a deceiver okay so while we are trying to bring the truth the devil is trying to deceive people deceive the minds of people so that's his strategy okay um i want to uh, let's go to second timothy chapter 2 verses 23 to 26 i want to spend some time on that to show us how to deal with uh you know as we are working with people and uh, having to deal with those who oppose or argue question how should we deal second timothy chapter 2 verse 23 to 26 second timothy chapter 2 verses 23 to 26. Notice what Paul is writing. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So he's telling us this is a very good instruction. How to work with people who are opposing us. They're challenging our faith, questioning what we believe, how to work with them. So I want us to keep this passage in mind especially as we're going through this whole thing on apologetics right that when you are speaking to people this is how we must work with them right what does he tell us verse 23 avoid foolish and ignorant disputes knowing that they generate right so if somebody comes to you Say, I want to debate. I want to argue. And they are coming just to argue, just to debate, just to fight. Avoid. Okay, I'm not interested. Why? Because it only creates strife. No point. So while we are learning apologetics, we will learn answers to all these questions. But don't simply get into every fight. Because some people are coming only to argue. Only to, they're not, they're not seriously interested in knowing the answer. They only want to prove, they only want to argue, they only want to prove that you're wrong and they're right. So Paul says, avoid. Avoid disputes. Avoid these ignorant uh, and foolish and ignorant disputes. Avoid it. Because it only gives strength. But if someone is genuinely asking, why you say Jesus is only way? Why you believe the Bible? Who is Jesus? Genuinely asking. Then you answer their question. So that will be very clear. right? Don't get into argument for the sake of 
arguments. Nobody is going to win. You'll only become enemies. So don't avoid that. But if there are genuine questions, then you spend time with them. That is the first thing, right? Then he says, verse 24, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. So don't quarrel. So suppose you are talking to people, they're asking questions. We do it in a very gentle way. If it is becoming an argument, if it is becoming a quarrel, then stop. Because he said, as a servant of God, you must not quarrel. But be gentle. Gentle In gentleness, he says, you teach and with patience. Sometimes people have 25 questions. <laughs> Patiently you answer. Okay, answer. But that is what the servant of the Lord must do, right? Don't quarrel, but with gentleness, with patience, you teach, you explain, you share. And then he says, in humility, so also be humble. So be gentle, be patient, be humble. So this is how we must engage with people, right? Don't get into arguments don't get into strife but if people are coming with genuine questions with humility with gentleness with patience you teach and why so that he says so that in humility correct those who are in opposition that means they are in opposition they're asking they're you know opposing what we are saying but as we do this hopefully we can bring correction Hopefully, you can help them see the truth. But we have to do it with gentleness, humility, and patience. Without arguing, without quarreling, don't get into this. Right? And notice he says, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. So it is God who is going to help them come to a place of repentance, not me. Be with gentleness, humility, patience, will teach them, will share with them. But it is God who is going to bring them to not us. Right? And then he says, what is the real thing here? So that they may know the truth and that they may come to the senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken by him to do his will. So look, there is a spiritual side to this. Right? There's a spiritual side. It's not about just you and me, you know, arguing and disputing and quarreling. No, no. There's a spiritual side. The devil has taken people captive. And only God can bring them out. Only God can bring them to a place of repentance. Right? Our side. Don't avoid disputes. Don't get into quarrels. But gentleness, humility, patience, you teach. And say, God, you open there. You bring them to repentance. Bring them out of the snare of the devil. Okay? So this is uh, how we are going to go about you know, ministering, answering questions, providing answers to questions. This is our heart. Is of course. If anybody is arguing with you, say, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't want to get into this conversation. Leave it. It's okay. You're following God's instruction. If they're generally asking questions, do your best. And let God give them the repentance. Let God bring them. Right? Now, let's go to John 16. John 16, 7 to 11. Another aspect that we must understand here, John 16, before we get into all the question and answers, we must understand the spiritual dynamics of what's happening. And John 16, 7 to 11, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. 
If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Look at verse 8. When he has come, he will convict the world. So the Holy Spirit has a ministry to the unbeliever also. So we many times think Holy Spirit is ministering only to the believer, which is true. He's ministering to us. But he also has a work to the unbeliever. And what is his work? To convict them of three things. Sin, righteousness, judgment. Right? Of sin. And what is the sin he will convict them of? Not that, you know, they committed murder, told a lie, did this. No. The sin that he's going to convict them is that they do not believe in Jesus. That's the thing he's going to convict them. Right? It says that. Right? Of sin because they do not believe in me. So that's the thing. The Holy Spirit is going to convict. Hey, you need to believe in Jesus. That's why it's so easy like on Sunday mornings. You know, if you've seen some Sundays. I, not every Sunday, but some Sundays. I just say, if you feel in your hearts that you need to believe in Jesus today. Why do we say that? Because that work is done by the Holy Spirit. He convicts them that they need to believe in See, that's the thing he's convicting. He convicts them of sin. What sin? Hey, you don't, you, 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 you're not believing in Jesus. You need to believe in Jesus. So it's very simple. If you feel in your heart, you need to believe in Jesus. Who's doing that? Holy Spirit. He's convicting them. They need to believe in Some, somebody comes that. I feel I need to believe. I must believe in this Jesus. Maybe all we've done is worship. Or maybe we, you know, we'll be, we'll be teaching from Book of Acts. They may not necessarily understand everything. That's okay. Some line, maybe some song. The Holy Spirit can use anything. Sometimes even the fact they see, hey, all these people are very happy. Just by being in that place, the Holy Spirit can use something, anything, and bring that conviction. You need to believe in. Jesus. So all we are doing is pulling that. You know, creating that recognition. Hey, if you feel in your heart, you need to believe in Jesus. You want to do this. I'll lead you in a prayer. Just so. so we are making use of this, right? He will convict the world of sin. What sin? They do not believe in me. He'll convict. Okay. Of righteousness. That means our righteousness is not of that standard. Jesus has gone to heaven. He has paid the price for our sins. He is seated there. And only that can give us righteousness. Not our own righteousness. Of righteousness. Of sin. Of righteousness. Of judgment. Right? Also, the ruler of this world is judged. If, the, if Satan is judged, Everybody else following him will also be judged. So that conviction for sin, righteousness, judgment, Holy Spirit will bring. So we just have to, you know, help them awaken to it. If you feel in your heart, you want to be forgiven. That is receiving righteousness. If you feel in your heart, you want to spend eternity with God. That judgment, you know, hey. There is judgment coming. I better be ready. That conviction will come from the holy. We just have to awaken them, pull them in. Okay? So, understand this is the spiritual side. Right? While we are answering questions, we are giving explanations, we are doing our part. Holy Spirit is doing his part. He is convicting them. Sometimes, even beyond our words, He'll convict them. You know, sometimes I've, I've heard people come and say, and after the sermon, they'll come and say, 
Pastor, you said this and this. And I'm thinking, I don't think I said that in the sermon today. I, I, and I'm thinking, I, I didn't say that. It's almost like something supernatural. That the Holy Spirit is speaking to them. And then they get convicted. They come. Yeah? And because I'm thinking like, no, the sermon was something on some other topic. And I don't think I said that. I made that statement today. But somehow that word will, you know, they, they think like, yeah, that statement came. It hurt, hit them in their heart. And uh, they respond. So it's it's the work of the Holy Spirit, even beyond our words, what we say. Right? So we're depending on it. Also, keep in mind that First Peter two. Let's go there. First Peter two eleven and twelve. The other thing I also want to say is that there are times when the Holy Spirit will use your life testimony, your testimony. That's First Peter two eleven and twelve. First Peter two. 11 and 12. Peter writes, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak evil, speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, Glorify God in the day of visitors. So what's Peter saying? He's saying, so he's telling believers, you conduct yourself in an honorable way. You live right. These people, Gentiles, unbelievers, they're seeing you. But now maybe they're speaking evil. Or just make fun, whatever. But they are watching your good works. They are watching your life. And he says, on the day of visitation, it means the day that God visits them. It says, they will, by your good works which they observe, they will glorify God. That means the life you have lived, what they have seen in you, the good works, God will use it on the day He visits them. They will glorify God on the day. They will remember, oh, this person lived like this. They said this. They did this. And they will glorify God on the day of visit. The day God visits them. The day God comes knocking on their hearts. The day the Holy Spirit comes convicting them. Then what is He going to use? He will use your testimony. What they have observed, he'll use that. Right? So, understand this is also a very powerful thing. That in addition to us giving answers to all people's questions, especially if there are quests, you know, there are people, there are, there are friends who are watching you or talking to you. Uh, they are also observing your life. They're watching your conduct. They're seeing your good works. Now they may talk bad, you know, they, as though you're an evildoer. They'll talk like that. But on the day of visitation, they will remember. And they'll glorify God. So your life, your conduct, your good works, itself is a message, is a testimony that God will use when he visits people. Right? So don't, that's another dynamic that we must not forget. Right? And a third point that I want to just mention here is that the head follows the heart. Meaning, the way God has created us, we have the capacity to believe even when we don't fully understand. We have the capacity to believe, even when we don't fully understand. The way, that's the way we are created. Because believing is of the heart. Understanding mind. Sometimes, 
even if you don't fully understand you believe if we give practical example we you know those of us you've gone into the aeroplane you happily go sit in the aeroplane sit down there put your seat belt do you understand how this big thing is going to fly it heavy thing we drop on little stone it comes to the ground but this big heavy aeroplane is going to fly do we understand the full dynamics or no but you believe you're going to fly <laughs> you believe this will take you safely from one place to the other you sit you're not worried you're not anxious will this go up come down <laughs> happily you go and get down just example simple like where in even in our day to day life many things we actually believe even we don't understand now we don't think about it this way but we actually saying i believe this it will happen so also in the spiritual things so it's not necessary for us to answer every question that somebody has for them to believe because it's possible to believe even when you don't understand so second corinthians chapter 3 um i'll just read verses 15 and 16 and so the whole passage second corinthians 3 15 and 16 but even to this day when moses is read a veil lies over their heart nevertheless when one turns to the lord the veil is taken away so it's like there's something that that's covering them that they're not able to understand but notice how verse 16 when one turns to the lord or the heart is turning to the lord then the veil is taken away so the heart is turning to the lord one turns to the lord the heart is turning to the lord then this veil that is preventing them from understanding is taken away then the understanding comes so the sequence is heart is turning to god then the mind is the heart the the head is coming to understand the veil is being taken away so a very interesting sequence so sometimes we can and you know we may be in a place where we lead somebody to faith in Christ they may have lots of questions i don't understand everything it's okay let the heart turn to the lord later on the veil will be taken away it means the understanding will come what is preventing you from seeing and understanding that will come later so understand that as spiritual beings we have the capacity to believe even before we understand so it's not like you have to answer every question in fact i at least i can speak for my own self i uh, you know and each one of us can probably give a little testimony where for instance when i prayed the prayer to follow jesus i was a little just about 13 or just before my 13th birthday i didn't understand everything i didn't the teacher asked me is your name written in the lamb's book of life i didn't know what is lamb's book of life i just knew i i said i don't know he asked me is your name written in lamb's book of i don't i never heard he said you want your name there yeah cuz he showed me revelation 2015 If your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, you will be cast into the lake of fire. They want your name there. I say, yeah. Okay, pray. I just prayed with him. Did I understand everything? But something changed from that day. From that day, I started seeking God. Nobody was forcing me. You know, you have to read your Bible. You have to go to church. No, no. Just something changed. How I can't explain. but this is what happened the heart turned to the lord then slowly the veil was removed i mean now i can understand 
but first the heart turned to the that's why sometimes even if people have lots of questions you can ask them hey do you want to follow jesus yeah, i want to follow jesus when your questions are not answered it's okay i want to follow jesus because the heart wants to turn to the heart after that slowly the veil will be removed they can see understand so so keep this in mind when uh, when we are speaking to people because it's not necessary that you have to answer every question no right? because the holy spirit is at work right and your life is speaking god will use that and the heart has the capacity to turn to god even before the mind understands okay and i just uh, look at one more passage and then we we'll close first corinthians chapter 1 so i want to what we want to emphasize is our main message is the message of the cross so even as we may talk about all these different things which we are going to you know learn as we talk about you know how to talk about answer when talk about the existence of god and creation and lots of different things understand that our main message is the message of the cross about what jesus did on the cross first corinthians 1 18 to 25 look at that carefully for the message of the cross so he's talking about the message of the cross that means what jesus did for us on the cross explaining that talking about that the message of the cross it's foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are saved it is the power of god for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom or through its wisdom did not know God. It pleased God to the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So I'll try to just summarize what Paul is saying. Here. So he says, Paul is recognizing, you know, in the world, there are all the disputers. There are the wise people. They, they come, they argue. Uh, there are these scholars, all these people are there. But our message is the message of the cross. We are preaching what Jesus did for us on the cross. That is our message. And in the audience, there are Jews and Greeks. The Jews are very spiritual people. They want science. They want supernatural. The Greeks are very intellectual people. They want wisdom. Right? So the Jews, they want to see the power of God. Greeks, they want some wisdom, intellectual, very think, thinking, thinking, thinking people. And Paul says, to both of them, Jews and Greeks, we have only one message. We preach Christ. Finished. Doesn't matter what they want. We have only one message. We preach Christ. And he says, this message, Christ crucified, the message of the cross, it is the power of God, it's the wisdom of God. That means in this message, God's power and God's wisdom is revealed and it's made available to people. It may be foolishness. Some people think, what, you're preaching uh, Jesus on the cross. To some, it's like a stumbling block. To the Jews, it's weakness. To others, it's foolishness. But to those who believe, they experience the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the point I want to make is this, that while we will learn how to answer questions and learn to all these things, remember, our main message is the message of the cross. 
you can uh, tell them about creation you can tell them about everything else finally you have to come back to the message of the cross because that is the message through which they are going to experience god's power and god's wisdom okay so we have kind of laid all the foundation right say so, okay uh, we will learn how to answer questions we will learn all these things but don't forget our main message is the message of the cross okay to tell them jesus died for our sins on the cross he was buried he rose up again you have to believe in what he did on the cross only then you can be saved hmm? we will answer your questions we'll tell you how the bible can all those things we will do but the may our main message is the message of the cross all right so we've done an introduction so far tomorrow we'll get into our uh, you know first topic which is on the existence of god how we can talk to people about the existence of god right so any questions here we have a few minutes before we close uh, so just a couple of questions yes please go ahead uh um uh first peter chapter 2 verse uh, 12 yes uh, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong they may see your good deeds and glorify god on the day he visits us yes so can you just throw some light towards the last bit pastor what is like uh, glorifying god on the day he visits us is it the time they have finally accepted jesus as a savior or is so, it referring to the yeah. second coming yeah so first peter 2:12 the second half of it on the day of uh, here it says the day of visitation or the day he visits us uh So what I, uh, at least I, I, according to, to my understanding, is that the Lord will. There is a day of visitation, or I would say, many times that God visits people. So when I say God visits people, it means God is knocking on the door of of individuals. He may visit a home, a community, a fa- a family, or a community. so individual a family or a community god is visiting he's coming knocking on the door so it could happen at an individual level it could happen maybe as family level at a community level sometimes the whole community god is visiting meaning it's like god in in no uncertain terms he is saying i'm interested in you i want to come into your life i want to save you and on that day they will remember your life your good works so that means god is going to use that you know and i think one of the most i don't know if you have time here uh but one of the most uh, things was like you know in college i had a roommate uh, we were we were roommates for 3 years and our lives were totally opposite you know uh, i i was serving jesus whatever i can his life was totally different drinking smoking everything but we were roommates because we were classmates and we were good friends but our lives were totally opposite and in in the room we should talk he should ask me questions about jesus and all that i so simply answer but i never forced him hey you have to follow jesus no i'll leave it god you deal with this after we graduated almost 2 years later after we graduated and both of us were in the us suddenly one day i get a phone call and it's my old roommate this is almost two years after we had not met now for two years because we graduated we went separate he told me literally he told me on the phone he said ashish i called to tell you your life is still speaking to me today so it took me another he just gave me a phone call just to tell me that and i was thinking hey i wasn't like i was roommate we were just friends we were staying in the same room i but god was using that to speak to him I know I don't know everything what has happened in his life, not uh, not in touch, but that one phone call where he just told me that you know, it's like, yeah, God will use your life to speak to them. Yeah, so that's that day of visitation, Pastor. And the Next second uh, question was like, uh, just like uh, what we've seen in the scriptures, like Jesus questioned the questioner. Okay, so sometimes when you feel in the spirit when someone is asking you just to taunt or just to instigate. uh so refraining from that does not mean uh, i'm running away from the truth or uh, 
anything i know someone genuinely trying to ask to understand or to clarify in their mind we feel in the spirit that peace to explain or to yeah. address the query but in a scenario where someone is just trying to instigate you or just trying to challenge you or just put you thing so refraining from that does not mean that i'm like uh, running away from the truth or i'm not able to defend yeah so refraining from those kinds of things actually wisdom it's a good thing because like paul said these things only lead to strife you know like them asking questions only to provoke us instigate us or they they're not really wanting to get an answer it's more to provoke us no? hey i'm sorry I, i think it's okay uh i won't we won't get into this now leave it that it's not a sign of uh our weakness or anything you know it's just wisdom because we know where this is going to go and there's no point in getting into strife it's a wisdom they may think we are afraid and all oh, god knows i know it's enough you know all right um, anyone with a question uh, online anyone wants to okay um so lucy is asking a question second corinthians 3:15 moses is read as it referred to our subjection to the law yes in second corinthians 3 uh paul is contrasting law life under the law and life in the spirit so when he talks about moses he's talking about law and he's saying how you know even in the old testament people didn't understand uh, they couldn't see jesus in in this so there's a veil put upon them minds but when the heart turns that veil is removed but answer is yes when he says moses he's referring to the law yeah all right anyone else any question yes okay okay this so people can hear you online yeah uh yeah pastor shared gospel with one muslim guy in delhi so he accepted jesus and he uh, he come with me to church and he is growing but the the thing came in between uh, like the rules of islam mm. so because of that he is telling like my, uh, my dad on they will like cut my head and all so in that case how what we can do and what we can uh, tell to him mm, mm. yeah so always work with people at the level where they are so you uh, we allow them to make that decision rather than don't make the decision for them you allow them to make the decision let them you know work with them at the level where they are so if, for example a person like this could say you know uh, uh people are threatening my family members are threatening me they want to kill me but i love jesus i'm going to stand for it and therefore i am going to go and live independently i'm going to stay on my own maybe they are old enough to do that there are adults okay you support them in that because they are in that level where they are able to step out stand on their own but there may be others who say say my family is threatening me uh, they are coming against me so i will just stay quietly at home i will believe in jesus but i won't come outside okay that's fine that's the level which they are at and maybe they don't have the capacity to be independent etc etc it's okay you just don't force anything it's okay that's if that's a fine it's okay and whatever encouragement you need you they need you give them you know you can pray with them you can be a support them but always work with them at the level at which they are otherwise it will be like we are forcing them to do something which they are not ready for yeah so all right let's uh, close for today we'll continue this tomorrow let's just pray and father we thank you for this time for the learning and uh, lord as we journey forward in this course uh, help us to learn and be equipped to serve you well in Jesus name amen
Thank you, Pastor.